My name is Greg Sparkman. And I'm Christy Sparkman. Uh, we served with the IMB in Jordan. Uh, and we have been with Oak, Oak Grove for uh, one year we've been members. We've actually been attending here for about a year and a half. Um, when we first went to the Middle East, we landed in Amman, Jordan, and we didn't speak the language. After a week, they took us to the middle of the country, uh, down in the land of Moab, and there were no cabs. The buses were several miles away. Uh, there was nobody that spoke any English, and we were stuck there. So when we announced to our family and friends that we'd felt called to go serve the Lord in a foreign country, um, and specifically in the Middle East, when we, through our journey, we decided on that country of Jordan, um, we were um, not embraced by very many. We were mocked by long-term believers. We were disowned by some, some didn't talk to us, some just made fun of us. Even family. Even family. While we were selling things, they really put the guilt trip on us. How dare you sell the kids things? How dare you sell your things? You'll never get it back. And God told us to sell everything and go. And that was a great lesson for us at the beginning of this journey. I never learned that as a Christian, as a believer, um, to really look at the Lord and follow Him no matter what other people said. I never really had that experience, but that, that, that was a great experience uh, to go through and a lesson learned because overseas it became much more difficult with uh, p people not always accepting us that we went to. We, we left everything to, to go serve these people and not all were welcoming, not all were loving. Um, even there was a conflict on the team. So there was, a, there was a team dynamic that wasn't supportive for a while. So we really had to, to strengthen our day and sometimes hourly relationship with the Lord on asking Him, what do you want us to do? Where do you want us to go? Uh, I learned uh, a faith that was unshakable in those times. Uh, just through lots and lots and lots of prayer and uh, studying scripture and learning not to just be a Christian but to actually be a follower of Christ. So uh, there was uh, annual seasons of, of their celebrations and I wanted to make one for our journey with Christ. The celebration between Jesus' birth, Jesus' death and resurrection. They have about a three month type celebration and I wanted to do the same thing. And I had to ask the Lord again, what do I, because I'm not a language learner. I have no idea about these people. I do not like to learn history. So, you know, the, the Ruth, the Ruth, <laughs> Uh, story and everything else it just bored me but like how do I tell these people now that they're loved and and God put it in my heart just a simple um, drawing of G a, a way to express Jesus was a shepherd and the cane and the way to express us as a sheep we are his sheep and the way to express sin is these this burden these these boxes tied you can't get rid of it it's weighty it's heavy it makes you uncomfortable and and that is the way that these women they some of them had terrible smells some of them fed me terrible things but they have Jesus can see into their hearts and so to explain that in a, in a drawing was what God told me to do uh, at that time and when they approached Jesus and said, Jesus is my Lord with his lips. Just as Romans 10, 9 says, these burdens are just cast off and they're free. And they, they got it because God, because I asked God what to do. And I'm doing that in the, in my community in Burleson too. People, I don't know these people. I don't know where they are, where their hearts are, but God does. Sometimes they seem very angry. But God knows exactly in the middle of the heart. So I, I'm constantly asking him, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? How can I serve them to show you? I want to ask a question this morning. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe tap into your childhood memories. Um, some of you are going, that's been a while. It's been a while for me, right? I had to tap back. I was like, man, I wonder... wonder 
about this. And so when I was growing up, we lived in a, um, lived in a house on a ranch that my dad managed in a um, small little three-bedroom, uh, two-bath house, and um, that was home, right? Well, when you walked into our house, there was like a, um, not a half wall, but like a three-quarter wall. And then it had, um, so kind of went up to here. It was that old, like, faux wood paneling. You remember? Somebody? Nobody? Okay. So it had wood paneling right there. And then it, um, about three-quarters of the way up, the wall ended, but then it had um, the round, um, what do you call them? Somebody? Sticks. Spindles. Thank you. Thank, somebody said that. I knew that. Spindles that went up so you could, like, see into the living room, like, I, we were, I don't know what we were doing, some architectural thing, I don't know. But it had that up to a certain point. Well, when you walked in our house, it had that on the, the right, and then and the door kind of went this way. Behind the door was all of our coats. And then up next was, we had one of those old phones hanging on the wall, like the old, and it was always fun because we'd bring our friends over and be like, hey, hold these two wires. And then we'd ring, and they'd be shocked, and so... It was always fun. We had that. See, some of you know. You're remembering, right? But then next to that phone was a plaque. It was a wooden plaque with a gold, you know, right, overlay. And on that wooden plaque on that gold overlay was these words, right? Joshua 24, 15. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I read that a thousand times. I remember walking out and just seeing it. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, right? Over and over and over again as a kid. And maybe you had a similar sign hanging in your house somewhere. If you walk out of Clinton Mariah's door, above their door, it says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Maybe you have that hanging in your house and and this morning, I know it seems an odd place to begin for the story of three characters named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Of this something that was quoted 800 years before. As Joshua stands before the people as their leader, he declares some things. He says, hey, choose the God in which you will serve. And Joshua says in 24, at the end of verse 15, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he makes that declaration as the, as the leader of Israel. And some 800 years later, we find these three young Jewish men in captivity in Babylon under this king Nebuchadnezzar. Finding those words that Joshua said some 800 years earlier, that they would have heard, that they would have known, that they would have, 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 have lived out ringing true as they faced something that they never anticipated facing. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so this morning, our aim is simple as we go to the book of Daniel. And it is this, that we are called to serve God alone. We are called to serve God alone. We're going to three, see three characteristics of these three men um, kind of right at the end. We're going to kind of wrap it all up, but it, you're going to see this in them. You're going to see courage in them. You're going to see conviction in them, and you're going to see commitment from them, Okay. Courage, conviction, and commitment in regards to how they serve God and God alone. But we got to walk through some text before we see that because I think there's some things that we need to see this morning that apply to our own lives. And then we jump to what it looks like for these three young men. So Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse 1, says this, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. All right, so King Nebuchadnezzar, end of chapter two. Nebuchadnezzar has 
been convicted about who God is, but Nebuchadnezzar has not been converted to believe in who God is, right? He, he sees Daniel and his three friends, friends that we're going to see in a minute, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they have eaten what they've wanted to eat, and Daniel's been over them, and they have thrived, and they've been good, and all of these things, right? Daniel interprets a dream for Nebuchadnezzar and says, you'll be the, the, um, the, the head of gold, but your kingdom will crater. And Daniel likes, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar likes part of that, but he doesn't like another part of that, right? Obviously so. Some nine years probably is what we think has passed by the, by the time the end of chapter two into the chapter, end of chapter three. But what we find in this scene is that that Nebuchadnezzar has decided that I am the head of gold. You know what? Let's make a gold statue, right? And he makes this idol, okay? He makes this statue 90 feet tall and nine feet wide. A little misproportioned, if you will, but that was culture. That was what it looked like then, right? 90 feet tall. That's roughly eight stories, Okay. And he, and he sticks it in what says the plain of Dura. Now, what we know about that is this, is that it was just a plain that would have a wall somewhere close to it, okay? It wasn't a specific place. We think maybe we know where it's at today, but we're not entirely sure, okay? So he makes this massive gold-plated statue, this idol, okay? And then look what he does. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent together the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the province gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. It's key. They stood before it. Listen. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So let's just stop here this morning before we really get into Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because I think it's important for us, especially in, in where we are as America. Idols are not new, okay? Nebuchadnezzar, right, builds this idol so that everyone would worship it, okay? Idols are not new for you, and they're not new for me. We just call them different things, don't we? We call them baseball. We call them football, Right? We call it band. We call it our children. We call it church. We call it a lot of different things. We just don't call it idols, right? So for us this morning, I don't think we're as far from Nebuchadnezzar as we really want to be, right? We want to be quick to compare ourselves to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Say, yeah, I'm, I'm one of those guys. I'm standing for the Lord. But I think sometimes we need to step back and be real honest with ourselves. Yeah, I want to identify with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But sometimes, sometimes in my life, I identify more with Nebuchadnezzar than I do with them. Because here's the reality for us, okay? The idols in our lives sometimes can be our own thoughts 
sometimes can be the things that, um, and this is how this works, is that we think something to be true. We think, oh, this is um, what I want. This is what I need. This is what comforts me. And I'm more concerned with those things than I am with what God's doing in my own life and heart. Right? So, so here's how it plays out. If your prayer, okay, if your prayer is more about God change the circumstance or the situation in my life than it is God make me holy through this circumstance and situation, you often find you can identify your idol. Right? Listen, I, I read this week, and I'm just going to read it to you because it is so rich, and I read it to Logan like four times. Like, you got to listen to this. This is a commentary I read. Listen. I know we do not naturally incline ourselves to identify with Nebuchadnezzar at this point, but I suspect we should. Do we not sometimes exalt ourselves beyond what we should? Do we not often act as if, it matter, as if matters of destiny are in our own hands and not God's? Do we not draw attention to who we are, whom we know, and what we have done? Is not the same pride that is in the heart of this king lurking in our own? I want so badly to identify, again, this is where I get this, identify with these three Jewish men. But before I do, I must ask this question. Listen, who is the God who will deliver me from my sin, my pride, and my arrogance? Who will deliver me from me? And I think this morning, as we move into this text, we have to consider our own hearts and consider the idols that may be on our own hearts. Maybe, maybe our idol is comfort. I just, I just want everything to be okay. If this would happen, this would happen, and this would happen, then, man, we would be golden. Things would be good. Right? How many of us have had those thoughts? Come on. Every single one of us have, right? If, if, if this would happen, this would happen, then, man, everything would be okay. Right? And we tend to think that way. If I could make this much money at this point in my life, then in retirement I'm going to be okay. If, if I could just rearrange this, this, or if I could sell this and do this, Right? If I could sell my house right now in this market, I could make a killing. And then we could go like live in an apartment that's 1,300 square feet. <laughs> 10 out of 10 do not recommend, okay? <laughs> but listen, we can discover our idols real quick when we start thinking about the things we think. I think we have to consider that as we move in to this text. And so then we jump in, and verse 8, it says this, Therefore, at, this certain, at, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared, O King Nebuchadnezzar, O King, live forever. Right? Sweet talking. Bloat him up even more. Verse 10, you, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning fiery furnace. We're just going to remind you of what you said, king. Right? You, you should live forever, king. But let us remind you that whoever doesn't do this, here's what happens to them, right? There's, there's, there's malintent, right? There's, we're coming after these three Jewish men because one, we don't like that you've already promoted them once. We're not a fan of them because they're Jews, right? Like there's this list goes on and on. They're gonna come up here. Well, just quick note right now, Okay. The longer history goes on, the more that people are going to come after the church, okay? The more that people are going to come after you for your beliefs. The more that people are going to come after um, our staff, right? 
right? There's just the reality of where we land in our culture and our society today is that people are going to come after you for your belief in Jesus. Get ready, church, because they're coming, and they're going to say these things about you, and it's all going to be a malicious attempt to attack you. That was free. Here we go. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed, right? This is your fault, king, who you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. All right? Can you imagine all of these officials gathered all from all over the place? And the music starts, and everyone bows down, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are like, nope. Like, just picture that for a minute. Yeah, somebody's going to point them out, aren't they? Verse 13, the Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king, Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands. These three men find themselves in a predicament, don't they? First of all, think about it. All the officials, all the province, music plays, everybody bows down, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego don't. I don't. It takes an incredible amount of courage in that moment, right? That's the first description we see of these three men is courage. It took an incredible amount of courage to stand for God and God alone. I'm not bowing down. Because here's the reality. For a lot, they could have, right? How many of you have ever justified doing something because someone wasn't around and couldn't see you do it? Okay, some of you are telling the truth, right? We do. How many of you have done something your parents told you not to do, and you did it because they were like, they're not around. I'm going to do it, right? Okay. Like, think about this. Three young men, they're in Babylon. They're in captivity. This once won't matter. Like, if we just bow down with everybody, no big deal, right? But they didn't, did they? In the face of unsurmountable odds, they stood and said, we stand for God alone. And that takes courage. Now listen, that wasn't a decision that they made in that moment. It was a decision that they had decided way before that point. Because let me tell you something. If you make the decision now to say, I am standing for God and God alone, then when the time comes, you say, hey, I made that decision already. I'm standing for him. Right now in the moment is not the time to make that decision. Because most times you will fail. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego had made the decision years before to say, you know, it doesn't matter where we're at. If we're in captivity, we're going to stand for God and God alone. And they had incredible courage in that. And now they stand before the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, hey, if you'll just bow down, all well and good, and we'll move on. But if you don't, you're going to be thrown in the fire furnace. And then Nebuchadnezzar asked this incredible question. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? And what's fascinating is at the end of this passage, Nebuchadnezzar is going to answer his own question. But listen, 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you this answer you in this matter if this be so our god in whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand o king but if not be it known to you o king 
that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. We have no reason to answer you, king, but just so you're aware, our God is able, but even if he doesn't, we are not bowing down. Not only did they have courage, but in the face of incredible opposition, they had conviction. When they made the decision to say, I'm going to serve God and God alone, they said, we're done. We're not bowing down to your image. We're not bowing down to your gods. We serve God and God alone. What an incredible, um, what an incredible thing that they say to King Nebuchadnezzar. Our God is able, but even if he doesn't, we're not serving you. What an incredible thing. How many, how many of you would say that? How many of you would say that? How many of us would say that? I'm going to serve God and go on alone. And I know that he's able to take care of the circumstance that I'm in. But even if he doesn't, I will not sway. Because as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then goes on, listen, we're going to finish this up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, as hot as he could possibly get it. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace, because the king's order was urgent, and the furnace overheated. The flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning fiery furnace. So listen, the last thing we see this morning is commitment, right? We see commitment. Hey, if you're bound up and tied up and you realize that this is happening, like I'm, I'm about to go into a fire. I'm, there's, there's things that our minds do, right? Like, oh, maybe I should, maybe, uh, uh, maybe not. We can go, you can go in and tie me, we'll bow down, <laughs> right? Like, think about that for a minute. They're human, right? They're human. And, and don't pretend like we don't have those thoughts of, Man, I'm bound up, I'm tied up, and they're carrying me. And, and currently, as they're carrying me, I don't know if you've ever been around a big, really, really big fire, but the closer you get to that fire, the hotter it gets. Like, can you imagine for a moment? Whoa, 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 maybe. I mean, at least one of them going, you can untie me, I'll bow down, right? But there's none of that recorded in Scripture. They're tied, they're bound up, and the commitment is real. Our God is able, but even if he doesn't, he's still good. Our God is able, but even if he doesn't, he's still God. Our God is able, but even if he doesn't, he's still king. Verse 24, then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego servants of the most high God. Come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps and prefect, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair on their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. And no smell of fire had come upon them. Can you imagine a bunch of grown men sitting around sniffing three grown men? <laughs> Just 
saw that and was like, hmm, all right, well, Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. End of story. You see in verse 15, Nebuchadnezzar says, And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? In verse 29, Nebuchadnezzar himself says, For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. We are called to stand for God alone. It takes courage, it takes conviction, and it takes commitment. And listen, here's the deal. I tend to lean people that spilt a lot of ink over who the fourth person in the fire is. Is it an angel? Is it Jesus? I tend to lean that it's a pre-incarnate Jesus walking with these three men. Because here's the beauty of all of this. Is that Deliverance and rescue didn't become the issue for Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. Deliverance and rescue weren't the issue. It was confession and obedience. This is who our God is, and we will follow him. We will follow him. And and, and the, the God that they confessed and the God that they were obedient to didn't necessarily deliver them from the fire, But that same God was in the fire with them and led them out of the fire. Hear that this morning, church. He didn't necessarily deliver these three young Jewish men from the fire, but he was in the fire with them and he led them out of the fire. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what circumstance you face, but as you confess and are obedient to the God of heaven, the most high God, know this, Be encouraged by this, that he's in the fire with you and he will lead you out of it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had heard and known and made a decision. And it's a decision and a choice that you and I have to make every day. What God will you serve? And I can declare to you with all the passion in the world, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Who will you serve? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word this morning. God, thank you that these three men give us an incredible example of what it means to have courage, what it means to have conviction, and what it means to have commitment to you and say we will follow you no matter what. Father, work and move in our hearts in these moments. Change who we are. Transform us so that we walk out of this worship center different than we came in. Father, these moments are yours. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen.